All right, good evening. My name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> grateful to be sober, grateful to be here. I want to thank the committee or the group of folks that, that, that went on a limb. <laughs> None of them have heard me talk, so it's all downhill from here, you know. And uh, I, uh, I have a sponsor. His name is Mike, Mike Sokio. He lives in Riverside. It doesn't really mean anything to you guys, but it means a lot to me, you know. Um, if you're new, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. They, they, they told me that a sponsor is like the, the, the spoiler on the back of a car, right? It just keeps you grounded, you know? And, uh, and uh, man, my sponsor keeps me grounded. I called him this morning. I mean, not this morning, it's a lie. Actually, when I got to the hotel and, uh, and I got honest about some, like, you know, fears and insecurities and just some, like, awkwardness going on between the ears, you know? I mean, I don't know if any of you are awkward, but... <laughs> I'm like the little kid in elementary school that smells like poopy pants and syrup, you know what I mean? I'm just like, you know, you know, you know, you know I'm a nail biter. Any other nail biters here? You know what I mean? I'm just like gnawing away, you know, I don't have any left. One's bleeding, you know, and, uh, you know, I have the nervous disposition the big book talks about. I, I'm an alcoholic. I caught alcoholism in the rooms, right? Like I didn't, I didn't know what alcoholism was. You know what I mean? How do we expect the new guy, you know? Oh, you're an alcoholic. What does that mean? It means I have a fatal disease that's going to kill me? Oh, dude, you're out to say you're alcoholic. No, you know what I mean? Like, lay out what alcoholism is so that that, that new person can, can understand w what alcoholism is. I came to AA, and they would say, are there any newcomers here? And I'd be in the back, and some guy's like, yeah, you're a newcomer. You know, tell them your name, and you're an alcoholic. I'm like, I'm not an alcoholic, though. I I'm a crack addict, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, it's AA, just say you're alcoholic anyway, you know, right? And so I'm in the back, and I'm like, oh, yeah, my name is Pat, and, and I'm an addict. <laughs> and the guy's like, you're supposed to say you're alcoholic, you know? And then all the old guys are like, Arr, there's an addict in our room. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let, let, let's get him out of AA, you know? He's going to infest it, you know? And I'm like, fuck you, old man, you know? <laughs> and I leave AA, and I slam the door for effects. I want to piss off the old guys, you know what I mean? And, and no one ever followed me out and said, hi, kid, my name's Bob. You know, here's a big book. Take this home or to your bush or wherever you're living. And <laughs> maybe you might have alcoholism, you know what I mean? And I go out there and I die. And, uh, you know, because members of Alcoholics Anonymous were more concerned about the singleness of purpose in the newcomer's life to get him clean and sober one day, you know? And, um, and I, I respect Alcoholics Anonymous. I respect the 12 traditions. I have a love affair with Alcoholics Anonymous that grows and grows on a daily basis. You know, I mean, I woke up this morning, man, and I said, God, please, if you see fit, allow me to at least help one alcoholic addict today. And I go out in the world, I do God's business, I do God's work, you know, and what I get to see is I come here and I get to put my hand out to you. You mean awkward poopy pants gets to put his hand out to you, <laughs> right? It's partly selfish because I want to get out of here, right? And all of a sudden, I get in the middle of you, and I start to hear your story, and I start to feel a part of, right? And I start to be, feel like I'm in the middle of your group, though I just got here. And I want to thank you for the welcoming that you guys have given me. And if you're new or if you're on the outside, if you're on the outside, come all the way in and sit all the way down. Come be with us. Come get in the middle of what we're doing. It's a life-changing, life-transformation program. And when I got sober on October 23rd, 2002, I crawled off a of skid row in downtown Los Angeles. And I hadn't showered in six months. I was up for 21 days on some high-powered accelerants, you know what I mean? And... Uh, I had two shoes, only one had a sole. I stood in the corner of Six in Los Angeles, and I was like, blah, 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 blah. I was channeling information from I don't know who. You know what I mean? I was like the light keeper. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and I was 98 pounds. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, my sponsor said to me, he said, "Anytime you get behind the podium, kid, you need to wear a suit." And I was like, "Why?" He said, "So you could show them that Alcoholics Anonymous works." You know? He said, because everything out of your mouth, you're foolish, you know, and uh, I thought, man, where's the we care sign? And uh, man, I love AA. It's given me a good life. And, 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 and being able to tell you guys that, man, is like trying to explain the taste of a banana. You know what I mean? I don't know how I'm going to do it. But I open my heart. I get honest. I get vulnerable. And there's a connection that happens. And I thank you for allowing me to be part of a healing process. It's a healing process. We come here and we tell our stories. I'm grateful that we're a storytelling society. If some guy tried to lecture me, tell me, I'd have been like, Burr. you know what I mean? I'm out. Don't tell me what to do. And, uh, and what you guys have done is you've shared your story. And what happened for me sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've heard my story a little bit at a time. I, don't, I didn't have the words when I got here for my story. 
But I continue to come here and I get to hear a little bit more of the language of the heart and allows me to have my story. And, um, and I'm grateful that, for that experience. And, you know, uh, just being a, bed, a, a nail biter, I'm also a bed wetter. Any other bed wetters here? Dude, good looking out. The one other weirdo in the room, you know what I mean? No, because no one's admitting that, you know what I mean? Bedwetter, you know, and there's a few more in here, you know what I'm saying? Just afraid, you know, I get it, you know. But I've taken inventory, man. I've been able to look at the truths about Pat O, you know what I mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out who Pat O really is, right? And, uh, and I'm a bedwetter, and there's a lot of shame attached to bedwetting. I remember my mom, when I'd, get like, I'd get like an invite to like a sleepover, and my mom was so excited. She's like, you finally have friends, you know? And, uh, and I'd go, I'm like, I don't want to go, you know? And I, I'd go, and, and, and I'd, everyone would fall asleep, and I'm like, don't go to and I'd fall asleep, and I'd wake up, and I like peed my friend's couch cushion, you know? And I'm like flipping it over, hopefully they don't know, you know? And I just like riddled with shame, you know what I mean? Just riddled with loneliness, man. Riddled with just uncomfortable feelings long before I ever took my first drink, you know what I mean? Like, um, and then I never got invited to the next sleepover, you know? And I was like, like, loser, right? You know that voice? Loser, failure, you're no good. I'm also a right fielder on the baseball team. Any other right fielders? <laughs> Come on, there's one of you. Thanks. Thank you. You know what I mean? I know we don't want to admit it. It's not the shortstop, you know what I'm saying? Or the pitcher. He was usually the coach's son, you know what I mean? I'd be in the right field. That fuck bastard, you know, he gets all the playing time, you know what I mean? I hated you, you know? And, uh, and I don't know. I was like wandering off to left field. I probably would have been diagnosed with ADD. I don't know. They weren't dishing out the pellets like they are today, you know what I mean? But, but like, I'm like in left field, wandering around. The coach is like, over there, kid. You know, I'm like, all right, you know. I'm like looking for the dandelion. Somebody told me if I blew off all those things, I could have a wish. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm in left field wishing for a different life, you know. And uh, I mean, self-pity is my mode of operation, man. I'm just like, woe is me, chronic. I'm chronic malcontent, man. Nothing's ever good enough. Then we go to lunch, right? I get, we get a hamburger. He gets lettuce wrap. I get the regular one that comes. I'm like, dang, I should have got a lettuce wrap. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's just like, you know, naturally, like, that's how I am. I, I, I'm self-centered. I, I mean, to the core. I remember one time I was on second base. I don't even know how I got there, right? Because I'm like the strikeout kid. I'm the kid that strikes out all the time. You don't want to be like ninth inning, you know, Little League. It's serious. You know what I mean? We're going to win this game. And the coach is, you know, Arr, you know. And, it, you know, ninth inning, two outs, bases loaded, and pats up. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, bro. <laughs> that's me. You know what I mean? And so... One time I'm on second base, I don't know how I got there. I was like, how did I get here? Where do I go? Do I have the right jersey on? Do I have the cleats, the belt? The... I got one socks too long, man. And the kid cracked the line drive and I ran back to first base. You know what I mean? And... <laughs> Bro, dude, it was like a triple play in the wrong direction. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Little poopy pants back to the dug. You know, and all my friends are running out of the dugout that day. And what I heard him say is, you're a failure, you're a loser, and you're no good. Now, none of them said that, right? But that was the voice in my head long before I ever took my first drink. Loser, failure, you're no good. And I remember looking at my mom, and she was in the stands clapping. I mean, so, so proud of her kid, you know what I mean? And not proud because I got a triple play in the wrong direction. My mom was proud because it took me an hour to get out of that stupid car to go to that stupid field to play that stupid game one more time. And my mom was proud I had enough courage to get out of the car. I remember looking at my mom that day and saying, if I only had a dad, that had never happened. And I built a belief system that was going to separate me from you long before I ever took my first drink. You know, my mom got sober when I was, when I was 11 months old. I love when the kids are here, um, you know what I mean, because that was me. You know what I mean? My mom was being sentenced to prison for 10 years ago, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. My mom's the kind of alcoholic that gets pulled over for a drunk, drunk driving and jumps out of the car and beats the cop up. You know what I'm saying? And she does it like 12 times. You know what I mean? And I don't know if she has alcoholism, you know. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but and, and so she was going to prison for 10 years, and, and my mom's also a blackout drinker, which means I'll never know who my dad is, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, for all I know, my dad could be the cable guy, it's like, pow, chicka, pow, now, you know, and, but I remember, I remember looking outside my window, my, my mom's apartment window, wondering if my dad was ever coming home. And I remember the car would turn into our, wouldn't turn into our apartment. It would come down the street and it would make a left-hand turn and not turn in our apartment. And, and I would sit up and just wait all night long for my dad to come home. And I remember as a little boy saying, if I don't have a dad, then there is no God. 
I signed off to this idea of God long before I ever took my first drink. I mean, my grandma took me to church. She was a Jesus-loving, hooting, hollering, did the dance and everything. You know what I mean? I was so self-centered. I was like, Grandma, people are looking at us, you know? And Grandma would want to dance around. And I'm like, nah, man, I ain't not doing that. You know what I mean? Like, what my grandma got in church is what I got here in Alcoholics Anonymous when I arrived here. She had connection. She was spiritually connected, right? And I didn't get that as a kid. I didn't understand it. But when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, what I learned is that I have a, I have, well, I have a perception problem, first of all, right? Like, I, like, the love that I feel in this room tonight was the love that I was raised with, really. The welcome that I got here, all the way from the pickup at the airport, to the lunch, to the hotel, the pickup, oh, to hear everyone. The love that I, was, that, I, that I got here tonight was the love that I was raised with. I literally, my mom brought me to AA, and the women in AA took me, and they would take me outside, and y'all spoiled me, you know what I mean? He gave me brownies and Rice Krispie treats, and he took me shopping, and he took, you know what I mean? He took care of me, and, uh, and uh, but I didn't feel loved on the inside. You know what I mean? I didn't feel wanted. I didn't feel valued. I didn't feel accepted in anything that I did in my life, you know? And uh, I remember I was nine years old and I took my first drink of alcohol and uh, I was at an AA meeting of all places. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Right? Me and my little friends from AA, all of, our, all of the parents would come in and recover, and we'd be outside just running amok, you know what I mean? And we'd ding-dong ditch the same house every night of the week, and uh, a dude would chase after us, and we'd run and hide in the middle of the AA meeting, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the guy would come, and he's like, where are them damn kids, you know? And the people in AA are like, there's no kids here, you know? And you taught us, how to, you taught us all how to con and lie and manipulate, you know what I mean? And... Uh, and growing up in AA, man, there's a lot of characters, you know what I mean? Like, look at the guy next to you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, my mom would be like, here, this is Tom. He's going to teach you how to fish, you know, and going off with weirdo Tom to fish, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know. Dude, Lynn was my basketball coach, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, and, uh, dude. But this night, it was a Saturday night speaker meeting in Laguna Beach. I remember like it was yesterday, man. I remember like it was yesterday. And there was this guy, his name's Rick A. He, he's been sober a long time now, but he was a chronic relapser. I didn't know that at the time, right? Like, he just sat outside the meeting with a trench coat on and an eye patch, and he was pissed. I mean, <laughs> and so we would throw little pebbles at him, and he would chase after us, you know? And he was a character, and, and, and you know, and I threw a little pebble at him like I always did, and he, he went to grab me like he always did, and I kicked him in the shit like I always did, and I took off running, and me and my little friends from, from AA took off out of this hospital, we ran out the front door, and they ran up the parking structure up the stairs, so I ran with them, and, and I was nine, they were 14, and then we got in between the third and the fourth story, and they pulled out a bottle of Jose Cuervo. And I didn't know what alcohol was to do to me or for me, man, but I knew that if I didn't drink it, those kids weren't gonna like me. I don't know if they have the D.A.R.E. program here. They have the D.A.R.E. program. Oh, they do. There's some heads bob. Remember the D.A.R.E. program, you know what I mean? And the cop would come and, you know, just say no, you know. And, uh, and you would have a little red bracelet. I'm like, hey, where'd you get that bracelet? You're like, I signed a pledge. <laughs> I went up to the cop. I'm like, I want a red bracelet. He goes, sign the pledge. I, Pat O, it's on. I won't say my last name. I, Pat O, uh, am not going to drink and do drugs. I meant the pledge. Got a little red brand. I was like, now nah, I'm in with you. Well, you had five, right? I, how'd you get five? Man? I signed five, five pledges. So I went over there, signed five pledges, met every promise. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. You know, my mom, I make the promise to my AA mom. Dude, I knew, I knew Alcoholics Anonymous. I watched a woman die of this disease in my mom's apartment when she detoxed. You know what I mean? Like I, the ominous warnings I failed to heed the book talks about. And, um, and I meant the promise. And that day, man, when those kids pulled out that bottle of Jose Cuervo, I knew I wasn't going to be like, man. They got to me, and I took a pull off that bottle. And I didn't, I, it was absolutely disgusting. It burned. I spit it out, and I was overcome with fear. And what that fear told me was that I wasn't going to be like the rest of my life. And the bottle went around the second time, man. I got that second, that second time, and I drank that tequila. And I could tell you the exact effect alcohol has on this alcoholic body. In that moment, all that fear went away. Like, in that moment, I felt a part of those kids. In that moment, man, I felt connected. I felt connected to you, I felt connected to God, and I felt connected with me. That same feeling that my grandma got in church was a feeling that alcohol gave me that day. And I didn't know that at nine years old, I wasn't that profound, you know what I mean? Like, I heard it in AA. When I got here as an addict, I had to look at how alcohol affected me. 
the, how, how it was on me, right? And so from that point forward, man, something clicked inside of me. I don't know what it was other than maybe what they talk about the obsession, but I knew, I knew that if it presented itself again, I was going to drink, man. And it didn't come in the form of alcohol. This kid handed me a joint, man. I smoked this weed in Dana Point Harbor. And this elf chased me around the park, you know what I mean? I, I hallucinated for like two hours. I laughed hysterically. And one more time, I connected, right? One more time, I felt a part of. One more time, like I felt okay with me. And I don't know if it was adolescence at that time, but it was like the middle fingers came up. And, um, and you couldn't tell me what to do. And by the time I was in high school... It was 1990, 1992-ish, 90, 91-ish, I was listening, like, well, okay, so I grew up in Mission Viejo, California, I don't know if anyone's familiar, one head's bobbing, right? No gang members until I got there, right? And uh, because I was listening to Easy e and NWA and Ice Cube and uh, <laughs> Poopy Pants had size 50 Dickies all the way up and uh, I had a 5XL sweatshirt and I drank St. Ides out of a brown paper bag, I, I poured beer in the curb for the dead homies, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> I didn't have any dead homies when I was getting ready for some, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I'm the director of the show, you know, I, my friends were hungry, I came up with a plan, they robbed the pizza man with my stun gun, you know, and, uh, and so I got a strong arm robbery case for a crime I didn't commit. And, uh, and I was in juvenile hall, and I was on house arrest, you know, and now I'm like, and now I'm in, you know what I mean? Now I'm a real gang member, you know? Went to juvenile hall, dog. <laughs> And so they brought me a needle and thread and some beer and some weed. And they're like, you need to give yourself a tattoo for your crazy life, you know. And so I gave myself three dots on my ankle from Mi Vida Loca and Mission Viejo. And I started saying, orale, you know. And uh, <laughs> they left that night. I'd never been in a fight. And I plucked one of the dots off. And now I have two dots, you know what I mean? And, and like just trying to explain like the character, the true character, right? Like awkward, poopy pants, afraid, terrified, alcohol, gang member. Alcohol gave me the power to go out there and live life. Alcohol gave me the power to live the life that I was going to start to live, and I had no idea. And I was 17 years old, and my mom was speaking all over the country. My mom was an active member in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, man, and I would, I would drop LSD at school and watch the teacher melt, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I asked for change for school, and I'd just get alcohol every day after school. And I would drink and smoke weed and, uh, and do some recreational cocaine. And... Uh, <laughs> and start to sell drugs, and uh, dude, nothing's wrong, ain't nothing wrong here. You know, my mom's like, you can't drink in my house, like I'm a sober member of AA, and I don't know how you hear that, but I hear you need to hide it better, Pat, you know? <laughs> and so I hide it better, you know, for another month, and I come home and in a blackout, I'm just like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, my pants are at my ankles, I'm peeing on my mom's fish tank, you know? And my mom's like, you're kicked out, you know? And I'm like, whoa, you know, that's a little heavy, you know? And so. <laughs> I walked in my bedroom and I packed my backpack at 17 and I walked by my mom and I look at her right in the eyes and I said, I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your life. And I watched my mom's heart break right in that moment. And I don't know how you deal with shame and guilt, man, but this alcoholic arrogance came out. I puffed my chest. I grabbed my mom by the collar. Sam said, to walk. F you. I hate you. You're never going to see me again. And I can tell you at 17 years old, alcohol was already making choices for me. Well, my mom said that night, she said, you can stay here and be sober or go out on the streets and get loaded, but you need to make a choice. And alcohol told me that I was kicked out. My mom was my hero. My mom was my best friend. And alcohol told me to put my hands on my mom. And I left that night and I went to an abandoned house where I was getting loaded at. And I took my first hit of crack cocaine at 17 years old. And um, I didn't know the hell that I was about to go down. And I didn't call my mom for a year and a half because I was going to make her pay for that decision. And uh, the first call that my mom got was a collect call. I said, Mom, I, I'm bleeding out. I need to go to the hospital, man. I don't know what's going on. And I said, I need help, you know. She said, I don't know how I'm going to help you. I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to pay for the hospital. And she said, well, why don't you just give me an address and, and, and I'll send them a check. I was like, oh, no, no, Mom, they need cash. She's like, well, I don't know how I'm going to give you cash. I said, there's this thing called Western Union right down the street from the treatment center you're the program director of, you know. And my mom ran down there terrified she was going to get the call that her kid bled out. And she wired me another 150 bucks, and a week later, Clumsy got in another accident. And she ran down there, and she wired me 150 bucks. And the next week, she'd go down there and wire me another 150 bucks. And I uh, ended up on Grateful Dead tour. That was fun. <laughs> 
I don't remember much of it really, but <laughs> Jerry died in 95 and I thumbprinted Crystal Wash LSD and fried for 59 days and uh, came to in, in San Francisco. Uh, my friends put me on opiates They tried to bring me down and, uh, and uh, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on, man. And I, I meet a girl, you know, and she's like, put, put me and brings me in the house and cleans me up, you know what I mean? And uh, can you get a job? And I get a job, and I'm like 60 days in, man. I can get a job. I can't keep a job, but I can get one. <laughs> and I get fired, and we do this dance, me and her, and Ben breaks up with me, you know, you know, and I do this over and over. And I was 25 years old, and, and I, got, I got this job. I get to meet this girl, brings me in, cleans me up, get a job. I get a job as the assistant director at a YMCA after-school program. Assistant director, after school, YMCA program, full blown alcoholic drug addict. And I show up to the elementary school, man, and there's like 200 kids, and they're just like, they love me. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, push me on the swing. Let's do this, run around. And, and dude, I'm like in the game, dude. I'm like, holy, oh, I've never felt this amount of love in my life. This time's different, man. I went to the girlfriend, I kissed her, man. Oh, I love you, thank you, right? Day two, I show up to school. The kids are waiting there, man. One more time, I'm there. I'm in it, man. Day three, I show up. Same thing, man. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know what? A bag of heroin would be a good idea. And I call, I call the connect, man. He brings me a, a bag of dope and a, and a needle and a fucking syringe, and I'm sitting in the bath, fucking bathroom stall. This elementary school is out, man. And the director of that school kicked in that door, man, and I was out, man. They brought me back to life, and she's like, you're fired, you know? I don't want to put any of those kids at harm. I don't want to get loaded one more time. And I call my mom. I'm like, Mom, I need to go to treatment, man. I don't know, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I can't do this on my own. I need to go to treatment. And my mom said, all right. And she sent me to Betty Ford Treatment Center, you know, one of the, the, the elitist treatments, the best treatment center in the world, I guess. I don't know, man. I, I, dude, but I didn't want to go to Betty Ford. I wasn't allowed to fraternize, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? I don't know if you've been to treatment. They, but I couldn't talk. To, I had to ask, what does that mean? They're like, you're not allowed to talk to the girls. I'm like, Mom, I need to go to a treatment center. This is going to work, you know? And she hung up on me. And, and I'm a rule follower for like three days. Well, I'm a people pleaser. That's the truth, right? And I could people please for three days. And day three, I'm in the infirmary getting my meds. And I, I don't know. I turned around and I looked. And all of a sudden, she was there. <laughs> I was like, whoa, and we were like, um, we were falling in love right there. We were married, we had kids, you know what I mean? We had a yellow house with a white picket fence. I knew she loved me as much as I loved her, so I wrote her a note, <laughs> and I handed her a note, and the next day she handed me a note, and I gave her a note, and 28 days later, we fell in love. Dude, it was like real love, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Dude, and I was like in love, and I was doing book studies, man, and I could, man, I was like the junior counselor, you know, in group, you know, like, hey, Pat, what do you think about his problems, you know, and I'm schooling you down on your, you know that guy, you know what I mean? It's easy to do recovery when you're in love, right? Right? <laughs> I mean, high, high, low, lows, you know what I mean? And I went to get, a, I went to my counselor, I go, Mark, I said, I'm, I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol, sir, my life's unmanageable, he's like, you're getting it quick, you know, I'm like, I'm doing good, you know, and. I'm in love, I got the notes, and we're across the room, you know. <laughs> and one day I went to get a note, and she didn't give me a note. And I, dude, I was like suicidal. I'm like, I'm going to kill myself. I'm over it. She doesn't love me anymore, you know. Just like, whoa, low lows. They're like, you need to go to group. I'm, I'm not going to group. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And one day they're like, get an intervention. They're like, you need to go to group. I'm like, all right, going to group. When she was standing there, I swear to God, the note was like this big, dude. It was like getting hugged by God. I mean, I was like, ding! You know I, mean? I was like, yeah, let's do that book study, bro. And I ran to Mark's office. I said, I've come to believe there's a power greater than myself that's going to restore me to sanity. And I believed it was God. I had no idea it was that note, you know? And my counselor's like, you're doing such a good job. You've got to do a nine-month program. And so I wrote my God a note. I was like, dude, i got to do a nine-month program. This is horrible. And she wrote me a note back in all capital letters, highlighted. I have to do a nine-month program, too. I was like, holy cow, this is that God's will that Mark's talking about, you know? <laughs> dude, I ran to Mark's office. I was like, Mark, man, I, I'm making a decision to turn my will and life over to her as I understand God, you know? And... Uh, <laughs> 
He's like, where do you want to go to sober living? Where should we go to sober living? Hawaii. I want to go to Hawaii, Mark. He goes, great. And, and so I got out of, out of treatment to go to Hawaii to be with my sober girlfriend, to go to sober living and live a sober life, right? And I got on the plane and the flight attendant asked me, what would you like to drink? Well, I'm a heroin addict, crack cocaine addict, methamphetamine addict, so I'm going to order a Heineken. <laughs> because Heineken isn't your problem, right? And so I ordered a Heineken, and 12 Heinekens later, I land in Hawaii. And I stand there that day. I get off the plane. I'm like, sober living or bar? Sober living, thinking that I'm making a choice, not knowing that when I put the first drink in, I lost the power of choice. The same place I was at at 17 when mom said, stay here and be sober, go on those streets and get loaded. I didn't know that alcohol was making choices for me. And I stood there, I said, I'll go to sober living tomorrow. Screw it, you know, and I walked to the bar and I ordered another drink, dude, and that girl ended up overdosing and never making it to Hawaii. The best thing that happened for me and, and, and when I went to treatment is they told my mom, you need to go to Al-Anon. Are there any Al-Anon members here? Thank you very much. I hated you then, but I love you now, you know? <laughs> because the language changed, you know what I'm saying? Like, I call mom, like, hey, mom, I need some money. And she's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, huh? She's like, no, it's a full sentence. Oh, my God, you know? <laughs> Dude, I'm like, well, mom, if you wouldn't have kicked me out of the house, I wouldn't be in this situation. I hit that guilt button, and she'd wire me the money. And I'd call her back and tell her how much I loved her, and she'd wire me the money, and I'd call, and she would, and she would say, you know, no, I'm not going to give you the money. I'm going to set a boundary. And I'm like, dude, if I only had a dad, I wouldn't be in this situation. And she'd wire me the money, and um, she wouldn't give me any money. I said, like, I need to get back to L.A. She bought me a plane ticket back to Los Angeles, and the last year and a half was downtown on, in, on L.A. and on Skid Row. And the hustle was up, man. Couldn't get money from mom. I couldn't really steal much anymore. I was, and, uh, and so the last hustle for me as a straight man, I wander up to West Hollywood and I flirt with enough men in those bars to get enough alcohol and drugs in my body and hope that I make it out before I black out, you know. I mean, that's the goal. Sometimes I would and sometimes I wouldn't. I started to live in this deep level of remorse and shame. And this this spiral. And three days before I got sober on the 20th of October, I crawled out of a motel sexually assaulted for the 12th time. And I had two options. I was either going to kill myself I was going to get a pint of tequila. And across the street was a liquor store. And I went over there and it was 5.30 in the morning and we were standing outside waiting for 30 minutes for the liquor store to open. And it was the longest 30 minutes of my life, man. And the anxiety intensified and the madness in my mind and the terror and the voice. And I was just, I had no, nothing left. And I remember when the lady opened the door, I got that sense of ease and comfort at once, man. And I ran in that liquor store and I got that pint of tequila and I sat on the wall and I put half that bottle back. Go, 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 go. And I sat on the wall as I. Like, and the madness stopped and the voices stopped and the anxiety went down, dude. And in the middle of this conversation, this time is going to be different. This time you're going to make it right with your mom. You're going to get the job back. This voice came and said, Drink that second half of that tequila bottle. And I put that second half of that tequila bottle back and I blacked out for three days. And when I came to on the 23rd of October, 23rd of October of 2002, prostituting myself one more day for one more hit, I had a spiritual defense that walked right in between me and that thought of that first drink, and it said, call your mom and ask for help. And I caught, picked up the phone, and I said, mom, I need help. And my mom on the other end of the line said, I can't help you anymore. She said, just stay right where you are, and someone from Alcoholics Anonymous will come and get you. She says, if I come and get you, I'm going to end up killing you. And she hung up on me. And I'm so grateful she didn't come because if she would have came, I would have manipulated her for 20 more dollars and I can guarantee you I wouldn't be standing here tonight. And she tried to call every high-profile old-timer and Alcoholics Anonymous and none of them answered, man. But the guy that answered had a year of sobriety and he was on fire for AA, man. He had the big book in his hand, man. He was like, bah, you know what I mean? He was gun tone, big book guy, you know what I mean? And uh, they book thumpers, they call them, you know, and he had just gotten off the phone, this doctor that told him he had four stage cancer and he had six months to live. 
And the next call that he got was from my mom saying he'd help with my son. He said, give me the address. And he went and grabbed a new guy and they drove down to that motel and they pulled me out of that motel. The guy walked right in and he goes, my name's Jack, I'm an alcoholic. And so the guy was on a walker, he's like, my name's John, I got 90 days sober, you know. (laughs) And I'm like, man, what a bunch of losers, you know what I mean? They sent some guys from Provo or something, and some hip slick and cool guys, you know what I mean? Yeah, send these idiots, you know what I mean? I'm separating from you, man. I'm, st- I'm keeping you at arm's distance. I want you to love me so bad, but stay over there. And the guy said, come with me, kid. And I got off that bed, and I followed that guy to that motel, and he said, get in the van, kid. And I got in the van. And he told me their story like I'm telling you tonight. And he drank, and he went to the hospital. The other dude chuckled. Chuckled guy, t- drank, went to the hospital. The other guy laughed. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't go to the hospital. I'm looking for the differences. I'm looking for the differences. I'm looking for the differences. But what I was doing by looking at the differences is I was looking at my own alcoholism. And there's people here tonight looking at the differences. I'm not like that guy. If you're looking at the differences, look at exactly what happens to you when you do drink. And before he knew it, I ended up at a place called Charlie Street. And, and, and Jack knew that I wasn't identifying with his story. And he said, Pete, come on over. I got this new guy I want you to meet. And Pete looked like you guys, you know what I mean? Hip, hip, slick, and cool guys, you know? And Pete sat next to me. And Jack said, when you drink, Pete, what happens to you? He goes, I go to jail. I was like, I go to jail too. He said, you do? He goes, what happens? I go, man, I go to jail, man. My mom comes and sees me. I make a promise to my mom I'm not going to drink. I do go to the H&I. I, get, I turn my life to Jesus at church. About an hour before I get out, Ochoa, roll it up. I give all the homies the commissary because I'm not coming back. I'm going to AA. And I'm sitting in that holding tank waiting for that warrant to be called. You know what I mean? And I get released. And I go, I, I go to the 7-Eleven. I get a 12-pack of beer because crack cocaine is my problem. And I drink beer. One beer down, two down. Next thing you know, I'm down the street, meet a new friend. Before you know, we're business partners. He said, what happened? I said, man, I got arrested. I ended up back in jail. He said, what happened that time? I said, my mom comes and sees me. I make a promise. I do H&I, right? I I turn my life over to Jesus. About an hour before I get out, methamphetamine's your problem. You can drink. I drink. Before you know it, I'm down the street, meet a new friend in a motel, solving the world's problems for seven days. You know what I mean? He said, what happened that time? He said, I got arrested again. What happened? I said, I went to jail, right? And I tell him all these stories. And he looks at me and he said, Pat, if you can concede both propositions, physical, that when you put alcohol into your body, you can't stop until you end up in jail. And more importantly, with a sober mind, you have a mind that's driving you back to the thing that's going to kill you. He said you might be alcoholic. And he left me in that silence like that, and I couldn't lie to myself. And I looked at that guy and I started to cry and I said, I'm alcoholic. For the first time in my life, I knew what was wrong with me. I think I lit up like a chandelier. He's like, I got a new guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dude, I was like, whoa, bro, you're going a little too fast. He's like, I believe in God. You know what I mean? That's how what I heard. I heard like, oh, it's all about God. Step two, you know, we came to believe. And I was like, bro, I'm out, dog. I'm out, bro. If this is about God, dude, I'm done. I'm over it. He's like, well, no, it's about a higher power. <laughs> Bro, I'm smarter than the word games. He's like, well, have you ever gone to the ocean and tried to stop a wave? That's a power greater than yourself. And I'm like, dude, miss me with that, dude. And he talked about walking his daughter down the aisle, and he had joy for his daughter. That was the most foreign thing in my life, joy for another human being. He talked about the happiness that he had for his grandkid when he hit the baseball. That was foreign to me. I came to believe that if I did what you guys tell me to do, I too could have joy and happiness for others. I made a decision to do what that guy told me to do, day one. And he looked at me and said, you need to take a shower. You know, and I thought, dude, that's kind of rude, you know what I mean? Like, it would have been six months, but I mean, come on, you know. And I went to the shower and I turned the water on. I fell down to that detox floor, man, I started to cry. Absolutely 100% broken down on that floor, dude, just crying hysterically. And that guy walked in that detox and he got down on the floor with me down there and he just held me and he said, kid, it's going to be all right, kid, it's going to be all right. And something inside of me shifted, man. I remember turning up and I looked at that guy in the eye and he looked at me and he said, I love you, kid. And I got a little bit of trust for another human being. And he said, can you stand up? And I stood up. He said, take off your shirt. I took off my shirt. He walked me into that shower. He stood in that shower with me and he just held me while I shook violently underneath that water. And that man took a washcloth and he took a bar of soap and the man scrubbed my back. And for the first time in my life, I was 27 years old, I felt love from another human being. 
He didn't care where I had been, who I had done it with, none of that. All he cared was to get me from that point. He picked me up to the end of the day, sober. And he said, there's some clean clothes on your bed. I'll meet you downstairs. And I went into my, that bedroom and I put on those brand new clothes. And I remember sitting, putting on those brand new pair of socks, you know. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean. And he allowed me to have the only bit of dignity that I had left. I remember walking down just with a little bit of pride. And I sat down with him and he handed me a pad of paper and a pen. I started writing inventory day one. Four days sober, I, I, I happened, well, I will go back to three days sober. I, uh, I, uh, I, I was really spiritual for about three days, full of gratitude for, for all the free detox and the free food and my sponsor. And three days in, man, I started complaining about the bed. <laughs> I wasn't grateful for the free food. And I was uh, complaining to my sponsor. And he looked at me and said, kid, he goes, you think alcohol is your problem? I'm like, well, duh, I'm in detox. He's like, no, selfishness and self-centeredness is your problem. He said, you see that guy right there? And I looked at him, and this guy pushed his shopping cart up to the detox and walked in and get a bed. He goes, I want you to go ask that guy how he's doing and tell him how you've been sober for three days. I'm like, bro, you have a year, bro. I only got three days. You're like the Dalai Lama around here. Why don't you go help him, you know? But I'm a people pleaser, so I did. I went up to the guy. I'm like, hey, bro. I said, how you doing? And the guy started telling me for like three hours about how horrible his life was. And I'm like, dude, why'd you ask him? That was stupid. But you're stuck with this guy. You know, so, so. And he paused. Right when he paused, man, I jumped in there to talk about myself. You know what I mean? And I talked about how horrible my life was. And I reached out to the sponsor guy. And, he, and, and I was reading this blue book with him. And, and, I, and I, I got on my knees and did some goofy prayer with him. And I'm, I'm doing some writing. And I've been able to stay sober. And, and you know what? Like, I feel all right, I told him. And I didn't know what happened to me. I had to look. This is looking back at my story. I didn't know what happened to me. But later on that day, I went to go see my friend. Because I genuinely cared about another human being. I go sit next to this guy. I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? And we start talking, and the guy went into a grand mal seizure from alcohol withdrawal. And in that seizure, he died right in front of me. And I looked at that guy, and I knew that I was no different than that guy. And I looked at that guy, and for the first time in my life, I cared about another human being. You know what I mean? And the next day, he looked at me. He said, kid, you got to go sober living. It's only a 10-day program. I was like, well, no, I need to go to the Salvation Army. He goes, why? I said, because I was court ordered. <laughs> he goes, do you have a warrant? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's like, oh, we're going to go tomorrow. You know what I mean? I was like, whoa, bro, no, dude. I'm going to go into prison for three years if I go. The judge told me, he goes, no, everything's going to be all right. You're sober now, and, and you got God in your life. And I go, no, remember, I don't have God in my life. He goes, you can borrow mine, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> And so I did, I turned myself in the next day and the judge looks at me and he's like, you're going to prison for three years, close the folder, the guard came, cuffed me up, took me to the holding tank and I'm like, see man, that AABS doesn't work, sponsorship doesn't work, you could borrow his God, his God must be small because you're going to prison. And I got on my knees and I was like, God, I don't believe that you exist, but this old guy John told me to pray, so get me the hell out of here, will you? You know, that, that, that foxhole, emergency rooms, you know, prayer and I get on the bus the guard the, the door closes the engine starts up man I'm going to prison and all of a sudden the door opens up and the guard says Mr. Ochoa I said uh yeah uh the judge wants to see you one more time and I go up in front of the judge and I'm standing there and the judge goes I don't know why I'm doing this but I'm going to give you another chance he said there's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and he pointed to my goofy sponsor <laughs> He goes, that guy's been fighting for you all day to get out, and there's a bed available for you that's Salvation Army, but you need to go today. And I walk up to the Salvation Army, and I'm met by a man by the name of Tim. And Tim was a guy I used to get loaded with, and he was the one that answered the phone. God is working in my life, though I couldn't see him. 90 days sober, I sit down with my mom to make this amends, right? And I, and I sit down with my mom, and, and I'm like, here to make amends. She's like, 90 days, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, you remember that one time I called and I told you I needed money? I go, it was a lie. She goes, I know. I go, you remember that one time I called and got asked for the money? I go, that was a lie too. She goes, I know. I go, you remember that one time? And she just stopped me. She goes, I know that every time you called and asked for money, it was a lie. And I was like, what? I was like, then why did you give me the money? And she said, because when you were 17 and you left, you broke my heart. And I sat up every night for 10 years waiting for the call 
that you bled out and I had to come to identify the body. And I felt that if I gave you the money one more time, it might keep you alive long enough for you to get to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got really present to the effect that my behavior had on another human being. I didn't lie. It wasn't about lying to my mom. It was about the fact that I robbed my mom of her security day in and day out for 10 years. And I started to cry, man, because I didn't want to hurt my mom. And I looked at her and I said, what can I do to make it right? And she just looked at me and she said, I just want you to get in the middle of AA and help as many people as you can. And I ran back to my, gave, gave her a hug. We told each other we loved her. It was the first time I felt love for my mom. I ran to my sponsor. I'm like, this AA thing's amazing. I was crying. Oh, I love AA. He said, what did she want you to do? I said, she just wants me to get in the middle of AA and help people. He's like, that's great. He said, but what about the money? I said, well, she didn't want the money. She just wants me to get it. Well, he goes, yeah, but AA wants you to pay it back, you know. I said, how am I going to pay back $100,000? He goes, $25 at a time, you know. <laughs> Dude, I was like, what? He goes, I want you to write a note that says, Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today, and I want you to leave her 25 bucks every week. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today, leave her 25 bucks every week. Mom, I love you and I appreciate you today, leave her 25 bucks. Six months in, dude, he wanted me to write the note every day, but leave the money once a week. Now it's getting a little weird. I love you so much. When I was five, I remember that one time. I mean, like, there was, like, teardrops, you know what I mean? It was like love letters to my mom, you know what I mean? It was getting weird, you know what I mean? And you guys were getting, like, boyfriend and girlfriends. I was like, what about mine, you know? I call my sponsor. I'm like, this is weird. I'm having a love affair with my mom. I'm not doing it. And he goes, he goes Pat, you don't have to do it anymore if you don't want. And I'm thinking. He's like, but how free do you want to be? <laughs> mom, I love you and I appreciate you today. <laughs> right? Because I want to be free. Five years in, I, my mom takes me to dinner. She sits me down. She goes, Patrick, she goes, I no longer want the money anymore. And I'm thinking, thank God, you know. She goes, but I still want the notes. I can tell you that I wrote my mom a note, sent my mom a text, or called my mom every day to the day that my mom died. And even greater than that, that note allows me to look at you guys in the eyes and tell you I love you and I appreciate you today. And even greater than that, that note allows me to look at the new man in the eye and tell the new man that I love him and I appreciate him today. And if you're new, you don't have to live the way you've been living again if you don't want. As long as you're willing to do a few simple things around Alcoholics Anonymous. Come all the way in and sit all the way down. I was willing to go to any lengths to get loaded, but I can't come up and get a commitment. Get in the middle of us and do what we do. And uh, AA boy met AA girl in AA campus, and uh, we went to Vegas, and she got pregnant. Everything was supposed to stay in Vegas when you go there, but <laughs> she got pregnant, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, uh, man, dude, it was, I don't know how to, I don't have a dad. How am I going to be a dad? Like, I was terrified. I tried every possible way to manipulate to not have that kid. That's my truth, right? I tried every manipulation tactic I had, right? And she decided to keep the kid, man. And I was sitting in that, that, the, the, I was sitting, she was at labor, whatever, man. It was awkward, dude. My mom's taking pictures, dude. It was, I was like, oh, this is so weird. She's like, you just stand there. I'm like, all right, all right, you know, and, and deals going on man and my kid came out and I looked right into the eyes of God I looked right into my kids eyes and looked into the eyes of God man. my message isn't to have babies and find God that's not the message here <laughs> yeah. new guys like sponsor said no relationships in your first year you know he's like I'm having trouble with God maybe this will work you know and uh, that's not the message but what happened was was for me it was like a chisel that knocked the ice off of my heart I didn't believe in God until I was 10 years sober. For 10 years, I said, God, I don't believe that you exist. Old man John told me to pray, and I told God my problems as if I believed. And that day, man, I looked into the eyes of God. And, and I'm so grateful for the women in Alcoholics Anonymous because you guys would talk in the discussion meeting about how the father of your child didn't pay child support. And through your pain, I learned how to show up and be financially responsible for my son. Through your pain of your father, of your child not showing up for visitation, I learned through your pain to show up for my son. And I would call the women in AA. I'm like, God, he has the hiccups. What do I do? They're like, what do you do when you have the hiccups? I'm like, I wait. They're like, perfect. You know, hang up on me. <laughs> but he would cry. You know what I mean? I don't like when he cries. I don't know what to do. What do I do? He cries. So I put him on my head one time and he stopped. You know what I mean? 
I was so proud of myself. I walked around all the time with my kid up there because I don't want him to cry, you know. And I was at my house, my apartment, and my sponsee was there. And, uh, and I, was, I was sitting on, the, on, the, on, the, on my uh, chair by my desk and my computer, and I stood up and I put my son's head on my, I put him on my head, and I put his head right into a ceiling fan. It was like whack, whack, whack. Bro, that's what my sponsee did too, man. I just handed my kid to my sponsee and I went to the back room and I got on my knees and I was like, God, I don't believe that you exist, but old man John told me to pray. So do I just put my son's head in a ceiling fan. I don't know what to do. And I heard a voice in the closet. Man, I swear to God, I was like, oh, you don't need to be talking to me. You need to call the doctor, dude. You know? <laughs> Bro, I was like, <laughs> Uh, holy cow, man. So I called the doctor, and the doctor told me what to do, and I grabbed my kid, and I looked at him in the eyes. He didn't have a concussion. There was nothing wrong with him. He had a little bruise on his head. But what happened for me in that moment was I cared more about another human being than the way that Selfishness and self-centeredness walked through that door by showing up to be of service one day at a time for you. I lose a little bit of that selfishness and that self-centeredness. You know what I mean? And my son has watched me in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, he's watched me. And uh, I had him this weekend. It's my weekend with him. I'm going to transition here, I think. It was my weekend with him, right? And he says to me, he says, uh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna, I, do you mind if I go to Provo, Utah? He said, that's where God wants you to be, Dad. Why don't you go there? I don't know why God wants me here. Old man John told me, you just say yes to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, why do I got to do that? He said, because that's where God wants you to be, kid. And I've continued to say yes to Alcoholics Anonymous, and life is big, and life is full. And um, because of my behavior in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll just be real with you. I cheated on my son's mom. Got in another relationship, cheated on that girl. Got another relationship, cheated on that girl. And at eight years sober, I'm not proud of that behavior. I would go home every night and want to put a bullet in my mouth. And I'd go the nooner, right? And they're like, well, you're not doing AA right. Or the, the line, you're right where you're supposed to be. Nothing happens in God's world by mistake, champ. I got 20 sponsees. I'm on committees. I'm an AA action figure is what I am. <laughs> I told you my deepest, darkest secret from the podium tonight, but I couldn't tell another human being that I was sexually assaulted once, let alone 12 times. I couldn't tell you that I was prostituting myself, and I didn't believe in God. And I still had a resentment towards my dad. My sponsor would say, you got to make that amends. I'm not making amends to my dad. No way. And I remained a victim in my life. And if I remain a victim in my life, then I don't take responsibility for my actions. And at eight years sober, I'm going to kill myself. And I'm driving 100 miles an hour down the road, going to barrel my car in oncoming traffic. And I heard a voice in the back seat of my car that said, call that guy Jonathan from your Tuesday night meeting before you kill yourself. I picked up the phone, man. I called him, and he answered in one ring. And he said, Pat, I've been waiting for this call for a year. And he said, meet me at Denny's. And he got out of bed with his wife. He was like a 60-year-old man, got out of his bed with his wife, and he drove 30 miles and stayed on the phone with me until I got there. And he sat down, he opened the big book to page 52, and he read these bedevilments, having trouble with personal relationships, can't control your emotional nature, pray to misery and depression, can't make a living, useless, you know, all those, right? And he looked at me and he said, what you think is a broken relationship? He said, what you're suffering from is untreated alcoholism. And he asked me if I was willing to go back through the steps, and I said I was. And I was suicidal in the rooms from eight and a half years sober till I was 10 years sober. And I don't mean just like I think I'm going to kill myself. I would call my, my sponsor on the cliff about to jump. And I would call my sponsor. And I said, I can't deal with this pain anymore, man. I'm going to kill myself. I'm jumping off this, this, this cliff. And he would say, how's an amends to your dad coming? I said, I'm not going to make the amends. And he said, kid, he said, I love you like a son. He said, will you meet me at the meeting tomorrow so I could say goodbye to you before you kill yourself? And I love that man like a father. And I said, I'll meet you at the meeting tomorrow. And I'd show up to the meeting the next day and he'd give me a big old hug and he'd kiss me on the forehead, which was just weird. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but I love this man with my, all of my life. 
And he'd say, I'll see you at the meeting tomorrow, right, kid? And I'd say, oh, yeah, I'll see you at the meeting because I'm feeling good, right? I'll see you at the meeting tomorrow. And then I would call him on the cliff. I'm going to jump. And he'd say, you made a commitment to meet me at the meeting tomorrow. Oh, I love you. Okay, I'll meet you there. And so we did this dance for a year. And every day he would ask me, how's it amends to your dad coming? I said, I'm not going to make it. It was the one I sat down with every relationship except one wouldn't sit down with me. The rest of them would. And, um, and I can tell you that I sat at my home group with five of those women on Wednesday night and where all of us are friends. And um, I pulled my car over on the bridge and I said, don't call that sponsor guy, man. He's going to tell you to meet him at the meeting. <laughs> and I said, God, you have 10 seconds because I'm jumping off this bridge. And I got out of my car and I got to the headlight of my driver's side of my car and my phone rang and I, it was an unknown number and I answered. I said, hello, this is Pat Ochoa. And the kid said, hi, this is Chris. And I'm calling you to say thank you because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you saved my life. He said, but I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm going to go get loaded and I wanted to call and say goodbye to you. And I said, Chris, we don't drink one day at a time here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to talk about my thinking that precedes the first drink. And I started telling him story after story after story. And I had an intuitive thought that said there's a meeting starting at 7.30. And I looked and it was 7 o'clock. And I said, Chris, will you meet me at the meeting in 30 minutes? I'd like to say goodbye to you before you kill yourself. And he said, I'll meet you at the meeting. And I got in my car and I drove 30 miles south to Laguna Beach Canyon Club. And I walked into the meeting and there was Chris. And Chris gave me a big hug, and Chris thanked me for saving his life. And then Chris asked me to be his sponsor, and I said, yes, I'd love to be your sponsor, you know. I didn't tell him I was going to kill myself. I just said, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I'd be, be your sponsor, you know what I mean? And uh, we went to the meeting, and I went home that night, and I was effing God out, F you God. I don't understand. Why you got to put another schlep in my life to help? I don't want to be a service to anyone else. Rah! screaming at God, cussing at God. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't. And I felt a hand on my shoulder push me off the couch. And I was in the fetal position on the floor screaming and crying at God. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. And I started to make an amends to a man I never met. Where had I been selfish and self-centered and self-seeking in every area of my life? If I only had a dad, I know how to be a boyfriend to you. If I only had a dad, I know how to be a friend to you. That little boy in the baseball field that said, if he only had a dad, that wouldn't have happened. And what happened for me was a victim was pulled out and the power of God went deep down within me. And I got off the floor that day and I went to my bed and I passed out just like that. And I can tell you that I've passed out just like that every day since that night. The 10th step says we have entered the world of the spirit. I'm going to end on this last story about my mom. And uh, because the 10th step says we have entered the world of the spirit. But what does that mean? We can feel it right here, right now. And those that can't, you have some work to do. And my mom had COPD. My mom rocked an oxygen tank like nobody's business, man. And for the last three years of my mom's life, man, me and my mom spoke all over the country together with that oxygen tank. Literally, dude. My mom, we were going to Canada, and I had a felony. I'm like, how am I going to get into Canada? She's like, oh, if it's God's will, you'll get in, you know? <laughs> so my mom's in the wheelchair, and we roll up, dude, and we roll up to the guy that stamps. I don't know what they call that, stamp guy. And my mom just started flirting with him. He was like young. He, he, she was like 65, and she's like, you're the hottest guy I've seen. You know, just, He got like beat red, dude. He just stamped it. Go ahead. Go through. You know what I mean? <laughs> I said, Mom, is that God's will? She goes, I don't know. It worked, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, dude, every Monday night, man, I'd, I'd go. I'd drive an hour in traffic to pick up my son to drive an hour in traffic to sit with my mom. Would bark at me for biting my nails, you know, bark at me for having anxiety. Stop, stop. You know I mean, I was like, dude, I'm not this living amends BS. I'm over it, man. And I asked my, spon my, my, not my sponsor, my, if I was a woman, I'd ask her to sponsor me. She's a dear friend. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And she said, you're going to have to teach your mom how to love you. I was like, what? Like, she's 40 years sober. You know what I mean? I'm, like, I'm over here 35 or 6, right, still being the little boy that wants his mommy to love him. And it's not fair. And so I started grabbing my mom and kissing her on the forehead like I want her to do to me, you know what I mean? Just started loving her. She was like a cactus. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, it's all sensitive and lovey, you know what I want her? And, and dude, 
and, uh, and I was resentful at the women in Alcoholics Anonymous my whole life because you took my mom from me. My mom loved you, you loved her, and I was always in my mom's shadow. My mom was thrown through a plate glass window by her alcoholic father. She took the abuse of her alcoholic father her whole life. My mom was, had an inability to love me the way I deserved to be loved. But I didn't know that at the time. And I'm loving on my mom and I'm doing all this and we go to Nebraska together or Nashville, Tennessee to speak and we're at the airport. And I'm like, mom, just get in the wheelchair. So I'm not getting that goddamn, I said, just get in the wheelchair. And we're fighting. I said, just, and I looked at her and I go, mom, when are you gonna let me love you? And my mom sat in the wheelchair. Dude, I was so proud, man. I was walking my mom. I was like, dude, I was like the most proudest ever. But I got a, I got a bright idea, man. I started running with my mom in that wheelchair. <laughs> Wheelchairs like this. She's like, stop, stop. You know what I mean? And we, we get to the bottom of this little slant, man. And something changed in our relationship. I didn't know what it was at the time, but something changed. And we get to the hotel and I say, mom, I love you. And I give her a kiss. And she goes to bed. I go to bed. Well, she had snuck into my, bed, my, my hotel room, and the next morning I woke up. I turned the water on. All this red water came out of the effing thing. She put a red dye tablet in there, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I came out of the bathroom, and she was like, got him, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and our relationship changed from an authoritative to a friend. And my mom was on hospice the last five weeks of her life, dude. And I would go sit with my mom because I want to watch my mom's last breath. And my mom says, don't sit here and watch me die. Go out there and live your life, man. But come back tomorrow and give me a kiss, will you? And I wanted to be with, with, the, with my mom. I didn't want to leave her. And I'd go give her a kiss. And, and, and I'd come back the next day and she'd say, don't sit here and watch me die. Go live your life. And I was going to Idaho to speak at a conference, man. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to miss her last breath. It was coming to the end. And I got on my knees and I said, God, please, I don't want to miss my mom's last breath. And I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to go be of service. And, and God said, you need to go be of service to AA. I said, I don't like that message. So I pray two days in a row. I meditate two days in a row. I get the same message two days in a row. I don't like it. So I do it three days in a row. <laughs> then I call the sponsor because he's going to tell me to be of service to my mom, right? So I call sponsor. I go, sponsor, what do I do? He goes, what did God want you to do? I'm like, oh, man, you know. <laughs> So I went and gave my mom a kiss, and I gave her a kiss, and I left, and I went to Idaho, and I was there for three days, and I was speaking Saturday night, and I was in this big auditorium, man, and I get this call that says your mom has been unresponsive for three days, and she hasn't, she hasn't moved, and she hasn't talked in three days, and you need to hurry up and get back so she can say goodbye to you before she dies, and I got on my knees, and I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but I'm willing to do what it is, and I heard the message deep down within, and it said you need to be a service to alcoholics, not and I gave a talk that night, man. And the next morning, I got on the plane and I f flew home and I got in my car and I drove 110 miles an hour to my mom. Just got to her house and I ran into the house. She hadn't moved in three days. She hadn't talked in three days. But when I walked in that front door, my mom sat straight up like this. And I went into her arms and she held on to me and she said, Pato, I want you to know you did the right thing. She said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that was the last words that my mom said. And three days later, my mom died and my heart broke. But what happened for me in that moment was there was a level of forgiveness that was so profound, man. I honored my mom's amends all the way to the day that my mom died. All she wanted me to do was to get in the middle of you. I can't force a surrender and I can't force a forgiveness. I continue to show up to Alcoholics Anonymous through all of the pain, through all of the goodness, with an attitude of love and service. And in that spiritual movement, I heal on a deep level. I come here tonight and I open my heart with you and I get a little bit more healing. I thank you for allowing me the process of recovering with you guys. If you're new here tonight, my message tonight is that Alcoholics Anonymous is a lot more than just not drinking. Alcoholics Anonymous is a process of growing up. And it's my prayer every night. You find somebody in your life that cares more about your life than the way you feel. My name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic, and I love you all. Thanks.